back to another episode of Vikingology. The art and science of the Viking Age. I'm co-host one, CJ Adrian. And I'm co-host two, Terry Barnes. And today we're going to answer the question, or try to answer the question, why are the Vikings so popular? Why yeah. are we able to make a show called Vikingology and have it be even remotely successful? What is it about Vikings that has allowed them to permeate our culture and our society, our ideas for over a thousand years? Exactly. It is the question that is posed by my very coffee cup. Why does a coffee cup with Viking ships on it exist? Why is that necessary in life? How does how did that symbol transcend 12 centuries essentially to a coffee cup <laughs> right <laughs> at nine o'clock in the morning on a friday in oregon <laughs> <laughs> or why why do you have viking shields behind you on your wall okay those were a gift those are explainable <laughs> <laughs> but why would they be a gift who thinks that i know my friend cj the best thing for him is going to be a viking shield I, they read my books, but then why did I write books about Vikings? How did I? How did I get into this this muddy water? Character flaw? <laughs> I don't know. Ooh, <laughs> why do, do I study there? Vikings? Why do I study and teach people about Vikings? It's the medievalists' conundrum, conundrum, right? Like, why are you teaching about people that lived twelve hundred years ago? Who cares about those people? They don't have anything to do with us now. So, what up? I I do just I this there's there is absolutely no academic merit to what I'm about to say. It's just something that I like to bring up sometimes when it's a quick quip to answer the question because I actually get asked this question all the time. People find out, "Oh, you study the Vikings, you write about the Vikings. Well, why why and why are they so popular because I see them everywhere." So sometimes I just say, "Look, the Viking ship became a symbol for we're going to show up and take your stuff." And so when, you know, the kind of the old trope of seeing the Viking ship on the horizon, the dragon head, you know, the dragon head prow headed your way and you get out of there. And so it became a powerful symbol to communicate, to communicate a message, right? To tell a story about who they were and what they were there to do. So at the end of the day, they were just incredibly effective marketers. <laughs> I'm, glad that, I'm glad that you aren't going to say that you just because you like stealing or something. <laughs> no, no, I, it's a marketing thing, right? They're just you think about what is what is marketing? Well, it's telling a story and and having having your audience identify with that story. Well, you know, peasants in the field definitely identify with dying. So they, they get the heck out of there. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think, I mean, for me, my my reasons are kind of personal, too, because it's the same question for me. It's like, well, why are you interested in being this kind of historian, you know, of all periods in time that you could study? Why do you do this? Um, yeah, and it is personal. And I will throw out there right now the argument that all of this is personal to some level, that we are, you know, interested in the past because of a reflection of ourselves in it somehow. But I mean, I've got Scandinavian ancestry, you know, surprise, surprise by the, you know, way I look. Um, and, you know, so that's interesting to me as far as just, you know, I'm I'm a sucker too for the latest genetic crazes in, in these recent years of like, where did I come from? Which I also have to say, I think is something that's kind of uniquely American because we're this country of mutts. And so we don't, we're not indigenous people unless you are a native American, which is a small you know percentage of our population. And so for people like you and me, we came from somewhere else. And oftentimes we don't know a lot about what that is. And so I'm interested in that. And, and I, I'm a historian, so I'm just interested in the past. I'm also, as I was telling you not long ago, I despise modern history. <laughs> I think actually modern history is a, an oxymoronic statement, but I, you know, the near, the near past is, is not that interesting to me. I'm really interested in pre-modern societies and probably a little bit because it's like, that's not who we are anymore. And so there's something unique about that. But so the Vikings, why not? They get away with a lot of stuff that we can't get away with, right? Yeah, I, I wrote a blog a few years ago about why I chose the Vikings as the focal point of my research and of my my historical fiction writing. It stems to this idea to expand on your idea that in the United States, we're all imports, if you will, or most of us are. So we're looking for that our place in history, in a sense. 
yeah. for me, it's it's an additional layer or additional level up from that. Having grown up bilingual, bicultural between the U.S. and France, I spent about half my time here, half my time there. And trying to, you know, always being the outsider. When I'm in France, I'm an American. When I'm here, I'm French. Yeah. And in both countries, I don't have an accent. And so I don't have an American accent French. I sound like I'm from France, which is really perplexing to them when I go over there sometimes because I'll dress, you know, with an Oregon shirt and I'm six foot three. And so in France, it's somewhat unusual to see, right? So people yeah. go, oh, he must be, you know, and then they find out that I'm American. They go, oh, it, it makes sense now. You're not one of us. You know, it's like, actually, I am like my family, my dad. <laughs> anyway, so, and then when I come here, people find out, oh, yeah, the, with a French background, then suddenly to them, I'm French, right? So being that outsider, yeah. it's 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 been a journey for me to try and find my place in the world. And how I've done that is by connecting to the past and saying, okay, today's uh, identifiers, how people identify themselves today doesn't really apply to me because I kind of get booted out, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm never part of the group. However, I am part of the greater trend, the greater history, right? So I can say I'm, I am part of this, this journey, this process that that is unfolding. Uh, I, I like to make the analogy, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, don't judge me, or judge me, I don't care, I love it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Star Trek is has a character in it. The the next gen. I'm a next generation kid, and they have Worf, son of Moog, a Klingon, and he's in the he's he's a an officer in the Federation, but he's also a Klingon, which the Federation doesn't always get along with, and he's constantly torn between the two. But then when he goes among the Klingons, he gets judged for being in the Federation, having been raised by humans. But then he goes back to the Federation and they accept him a little bit better, but he's still a Klingon and they have to treat him a little bit differently. Like one of the best scenes in the in the show that that I really identify with is Worf is having like a spiritual crisis. And so he lights a fire in his quarters and then the captain has to go down and like walks into just Worf being out of his mind. Like I, you know, it, and I'm just like, wow, that's like what my midlife crisis is going to look like. <laughs> I don't know. I think to me that that stuff is like about the eternal human story, right? Almost no matter what time period you put it in. And so that's another thing about, you know, sort of recognizing ourselves in Vikings, even though they're this culture that were, was from a long time ago, is that they still are, I mean, it's all over the mythology and everything. I mean, they're still dealing with the same kinds of issues, you know, making order out of chaos, even though they create chaos. Um, good versus evil, you know, what does it mean to be a dranger, right? Or or steer whatever um these mm -hmm. words that we've learned and to be a good honorable person and live a good life and and all of that so um yeah i don't know that that's that's the whole part of it right like you're saying i mean you're really like what i like to call like a citizen of humanity right you, you know mm -hmm. you're, you're you're part of the unfolding story and um i think Heart history and storytelling is hardwired in the human brain. I mean, we kind of know that, I think. And and so, you know, learning about where we fit in this and then learning about other interesting cultures is just part of who we are. And it's cool. Yeah. But I think, though, you know, so one of the things, I don't know, one of the things that I think is fun about the Vikings, because for people like us, we know what issues there are with the sources, right? And bias in the sources or sources just, just don't exist because for much of the Viking age, the Vikings are, at least in the modern sense of things, what we would have called illiterate people. So they're not writing their own history and all of that. So there's all these huge gaps. And yet when I ask my students or any other people about what they think of when they think of Vikings and stuff, they're very clear about it. It it comes to them right away. You know, they have certain ideas about what a Viking is, and it's like, well, how can you be so sure when we're actually not that sure on some level? And so, to me, that tension is really interesting. Well, that brings up a good point. Maybe because, as to your to your original point, this is a very personal thing for us, and we've taken it to an extreme that most people are never going to take it to. But as far as why Vikings are so popular in the general conscience or the general public in popular culture, it might be helpful to to understand what a Viking is to the general population who don't know as much as we do. And I think with your students who come in and really, you know, it's their first time looking at this subject, you do an activity with them that helps to to flush that out. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah, exactly. So let me show you a little bit about what that looks like. So the activity is basically just saying, um, you know, 
uh, what is a Viking? Just like straight up, like when you are looking at talking about Vikings and I say just that word, what is it that comes to mind for you? Um, and so I made a word cloud out of the most common things that they say. And this is, this is that. So I don't know. What do you think about this? Well, let's go over a couple of them. Like a warrior. <laughs> That's Clear. the first thing. So people think of Vikings, they think of warriors and badass okay uh is that is that how we would think of them terry i don't that's not the first thing i think of i mean my character hasting in the novels certainly certainly in modern terminology would qualify under that he's also kind of incompetent though so you know, he's, <laughs> he's human he's human <laughs> that is the, yeah i have to say i mean because i'm entering the end of a a, a you know what our, our quarter semester thingies here in, in where i teach and uh, we're getting to that point of like they know enough now and it's like what do you think about who they are and this is what's coming to light which is what i'm delighted to hear in what i hope comes to light you know but without sort of you know, pointing them so much in that direction. I want them to find it out for themselves, but it's at the end of the day, guess what? Vikings were human beings and human beings are complex and nuanced and they're not all this or all that. They're all of it, right? So, and this is like how you can get dirty and clean <laughs> in the same same word, you know? So they're, they're everything. They're a little bit of everything. Right, it's their... They have been adapted to what people want to see in them, which is interesting because I feel like we could take other modern topics, modern figures, ask the same question. Right. What is this person? What are words that describe this theme or person and whatnot? And we might get the same thing. Like, let's let's take some popular, let's go back to the 80s, for example, and yeah. say Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, kind of the, the yeah. action stars. And yeah. what what kind of labels would they have gotten? Well, not pagan, obviously, because, you know, that wouldn't really yeah. apply, but like but, warrior, big in the sense, you know, that that's what all of those were about. And I think in our popular culture, we admire strong people, warriors, right? And then, yeah. you know, badass. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty, you know, so it, considering that's the big one in the middle, it's yeah. the the runaway winner there. Yeah. Um. I think that is, there's a cultural affinity, I think, towards towards that. We all admire those people who who rise to the top, right? Um, just like in in if you go back to Greek history, nobody talks about, you know, Corinth. <laughs> right. <laughs> they they all talk about Sparta. Why? Because they right. were warriors, badasses. Uh, right. kind of that same that same idea. So Vikings appear to have fallen into this category whether that is justified or not. Yeah, even with the, um, you know, I mean, obviously warrior is the word that looms large, but right underneath it, same theme, tough women. So they they, they want, we want everybody to be kind of tough, a winner. But it's it's also, it, it strikes me as a, a kind of projection of the modern conscience onto a historical theme, right? Yeah. Because this is what we look for in in people today almost, right? You think of all the top, I'm thinking this is just fresh in my mind, but there's a, a a gentleman who's a motivational speaker who does pretty intense things. David Goggins, he does ultra. Yeah, I know who that is. I know who and those is. sorts of things. I mean, you could and his whole his whole premise is he went from before he was a Navy SEAL, he was you know nothing. Then he yeah. became a Navy SEAL and it sharpened him, and he became a warrior and a badass, you know. And and right. now he's making money with his book, so he's technically a trader, you know. So these are these are actually attributes that we admire in modern public figures. Right. That are then also being applied to the Vikings in a certain sense. I could be off, but that's this no, certainly. I, no way. I, yeah, for for my money, like I, I mean, I've been studying this. I've been intrigued by this for at least ten years. It's some of the earliest stuff about the Viking Age that I've written and looked into, and it actually has more to do with with us than it does with the Vikings. And that's definitely the takeaway: is that. We we definitely look to the past, um, not only for the objective lessons that it can teach us, uh, you know, I would say primarily we look to it for finding ourselves and we, you know, try to uh, relate to it. And what how do you do that? The only way you can do that is by relating to it through your own lens. And, the you know, I mean, and this is definitely something that any any professional historian 
well knows this is probably like day one of graduate school you know we we looking at the past and talking about it as an interpretive art right the art and science of the viking age well that's the art part of it you look at the sources mm -hmm. and i'm going to look at the same sources that you do but i'm going to see a different story there than you do why because i'm me and you're you and i have a whole set of life experiences and ideas that i filter those things through and so I'm going to see things and be gravitating towards things that I think are interesting or cool or would like to have happened, like the whole shield maiden thing that seems to be very interesting to so many people. It's like, I, I, you know, I, that to me is really a, a kind of a, an intriguing thing because it's like, why do we even care if there were shield maidens? What difference does it make to us? Like zero, you know, except for we really want that, or at least some people really want that to have been the case. So it's like, well, why? Well, because we value women in the modern era, at least in modern Western cultures that, you know, are, are strong. I mean, we live in a post-feminist environment, right? So we have this idea about that. And all it is about is just sort of looking for ourselves in the past. I do want to point out there's the word, I keep seeing the word beards and it's just sticking yeah. out to me. And I, <laughs> I, I, you and I both live in Oregon. So I think you'll be in tune with, with <laughs> what I'm about to say, which is, you're the whole hipster hipster <laughs> i'm gonna grow out this big thick viking looking beard right. while i'm wearing overalls and drinking a cafe latte from starbucks right so it's <laughs> yeah you know the beards thing it just keeps popping up it was just sticking out to me like that's that is a trend in modern in yeah. modern society where beards are becoming more and more acceptable right because it used to be everybody had to be clean shaven shaved right. like a frank <laughs> right, right. And, and now they're becoming a thing and so then you see that echoed in this you know, there's, yeah. this is all interpretive, but it's, you know, it's a curiosity. So if this is what we, if this is what people see within Vikings, so why, why are these things popular? And then how did Vikings become, because it could have been Spartans, it could have been any other group. So why, why the Vikings in particular, how did they become the ones to embody all of these things and to really latch on to the public consciousness in such a way that they have enduringly remained yeah. one of the most popular topics in history. Okay, so yeah, all right. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that's the $64 million question. And I, I actually, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, and I think that the, the answer to that is probably as variant as the number of people that you ask that question. But um, I mean, they are everywhere, right? I mean, I showed my coffee cup, uh, but here, let me show you some other things. So um, these are things that in my class we call Viking sightings, right? Because it's like, you know, have you ever had that like phenomenon of like you, you buy a new car and then suddenly like you never noticed that car before, but now like looks like everybody else on the road drives that car too. It's like, it's just in, mm -hmm. your, in your consciousness, right? So, all right, students, you're taking my class. I'm talking to you about Vikings. I'm telling you they're out there everywhere. You just never noticed, but now you will. And so um, here's some of the sightings just to be like, okay, why Vikings? But here they are. Um, let me see. Okay, there you go. So I don't know. Wow. It's, it's a construction company. Does it? I mean, maybe that's legit. That person's name. I don't know, but you know, there it is with the Thor's hammer and everything. So we we see that and we receive it in, in a certain way. But I I do wonder. It'd be fun to talk to the owner of that company and see what yeah. do you what do you feel that communicates? <laughs> yeah, in well, regards like, to your business. Yeah. Or how about this? This to me is like really. I don't know. That one scares me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, we definitely know Vikings had animals, but we also know that like a lot of the animals they had ended up getting killed and put into graves with people. I don't know. It's just all right. Yeah. So what what I'd like to ask them too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Bifrost. Yeah. I feel like this is just somebody jumping on the trend bang bandwagon, right? Well, I think <laughs> at least, you know, there's enough of this kind of stuff to get a sense of like, all right, we get it. The Vikings were drinkers <laughs> because uh -huh. it's like, okay, that, uh, how about that? So that's uh, one of the kind of uh, more crafty brews. But look, horned helmets, come on, Iceland, for shame, for shame. Uh, well, there you go. There, that, And this is like essentially uh, Icelandic Budweiser. This Viking is the largest brewery there. And that's their beer that's, you know, just kind of their ordinary lager beer. So 
okay, it's Iceland. I get it. Viking kind of makes sense there, right? But alcohol yeah. is a big deal. Oh, and here, okay, so how about that? If you're going to make a fire pit. <laughs> that's just cool. That's just really cool. Again, right? with the horns, though. <laughs> I know, right? Well, the the uh, the prow on that one looks more like the prow at the end of the boat at the end of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yeah, where they go they go to that <laughs> island to find you know, and then they run into the French. <laughs> yeah, and then, but like, look at the this one. It's like it, yeah. it's it, it's kind of going the opposite way it should be going, but it, so it looks like a little curly, uh, like a Dr. Seuss boat or something. I don't know. Right. <laughs> um, so here's a meme. I love this one. I'm not sure Disney fully understands what a pirate is. A good pirate never takes another person's property. Right? I mean, <laughs> okay. it's not typically Viking, but this is like, okay, Vikings are pirates. So, right, we get that. Yeah, that's... Uh, all right, well, let's... Okay, how about this? Well, well who was it? It was uh, Steve Martin who said, yeah. you want to be mean to your kid? Teach them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So here's your um, cookie sheets, baking sheets, right? Uh, Nordic wear. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's Fine. okay. I mean, they're they're on everything. How about sour yourself? Viking? Sour Viking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm glad to see that the it's non-GMO and vegan because that would have been important to Vikings. <laughs> oh goodness. Why do you do this, people? What do you? Oh, here we go. I saw this. Actually, this is my own sighting up in this uh, grocery store in Seattle. So I had to buy that, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Valkyrie. Valhalla Coffee Company, the Valkyrie blend. See? I don't even know how that. <laughs> this one's good. Volcanic <laughs> peppers, Thor's <laughs> hammer, super hot sauce. <laughs> There's Thor right on the cover. You know, they missed an opportunity there because I feel like, you know, the the, the Vikings were at least the Swedes were going east into the Middle East and they were bringing back spices. So I they, they totally missed the mark there because they could have actually done something fairly accurate by saying like, you know, uh, Const you know Constantinople red or something, you know, like so, some kind of interesting, like to go Thor's hammer, super hot sauce, you know, okay, that's just... I don't know where they get. I feel Thor. like that's a missed opportunity. Yeah, the connection between Thor and hot. I don't know what what is that about. And also like peppers. Well, so these people maybe don't understand this thing called the Colombian Exchange, where people in Scandinavia wouldn't have known what the hell a hot pepper was <laughs> because those were grown and those right. originated in the Americas. So sorry. Uh, so yeah. Uh, here we go. Here's a sticker. Right. That's. That was the uh, scene on the water bottle of a Trader Joe's employee. <laughs> okay. Loki for president. I like right, it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know I, if he'd be the best president. I, but, yeah. I think he would be a terrible president. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Loki, here's another one. And I love this, right? Do you see that? Brewed from the magical waters of the Clackamas River. <laughs> Ooh. For, for those that is who are really are not Viking who are not in the Oregon area. Clackamas is a river here that uh, is near the Portland area. Um, so yeah, horns and more horns. Oh, here you go. You want to really go on a cruise, go on the Viking River. Oh yeah, Viking River. Now this one makes sense to me. Right, right. It really does. It's a Norwegian company, number one. Okay, that gives right. it to them. But then they're going, they're river cruises, which is essentially what the Vikings were doing. Right. Right. I know. I know. So the only thing I wish they would do is put a dragon headed prow on the boat. That's all I'm asking. Oh, that'd be great. Wouldn't it? And shields on the <laughs> side. Shields on the well, side. And, then, and they go up the river systems that the Vikings were going up. So this is all making sense to me. Viking river cruises, okay. they get a pass. I think they did the best job of anybody. Okay. Okay. So they're winning. Uh, what do we, oh, here, here is in Albany, Oregon. This is the gun store. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think the the uh, amount of referencing to Norse mythology and Vikings, et cetera, at least in Oregon, I mean, we there's a a large Scandinavian immigration period, right? You know, in the 20th century, where so there there there's a large community, like there's the um, uh, what's the Norwegian house? Nordia. Why am I spacing on it? Uh, yeah. No, or, the oh. Like we have a chapter here, Sons of Norway. There we go. Oh, yeah, Sons yeah, of yeah. Norway. Yeah. It's huge. I mean, there's they have 
like I live in Bend, Oregon. We have a hundred thousand people. And I think they have like 8,000 members. I mean, that's a significant mm-hmm. portion of the population, you know? So right. it's, so there's, there's a lot of that here that I think is part of that going back to it's personal as people saying, Hey, you know, I have ancestors that go back to Norway. You know, it's like, I've, it's, yeah. it's kind of like I've met American girl, you know, American women. I've been married twice. And then both of them are at least half Norwegian. I mean, yeah. that's just, that's because that's just statistically speaking, that's just going to happen around here. <laughs> right. Okay. So we'll give them a kind of a pass maybe. Um, a little bit, you know? Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, oh, so here we go. This is a new series on Amazon, which was, you know, kind of a medieval sci-fi sort of stuff. But it's like interesting to me that, uh, you know, the icon there. Do you know what that icon is? Yeah, it's the serpent need hog chewing on his own tail. Or Jormungandr, not need hog, but your Yeah, it's, so it's, it's... I thought it was need hog. No, it's it's Jormungandr, the world serpent, the one that circles the earth and then um, uh, bites his own tail. It's, it's Loki's kid. Um, oh, the one that a Nidhogg is the one that's chewing at the roots of Yggdrasil. Then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There we go. Okay. I got okay. my serpents mixed up. Here you go. Oregon <laughs> Pinot Noir. So I don't know. I'm not sure Thor was a wine drinker. Could have been. <laughs> hey, the the Vikings who went to France, that was their one of their yeah. big exports, right? Yeah. Wine. French like wine. Right. <laughs> yep. Okay. So yeah, you got your Viking ship and everything right there. Oh, here's your, uh, I got this for my dad for Father's Day, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Pa Thor. I think you, I think, you, uh, I think Leif needs to get you this shirt. Like a dad, just way cooler. See, yeah. also, handsome, exceptional. Right? Mm. Right? Mm. What else do I got? Oh, there's that again. I have more on the, on the, on the vehicles, whatever that is. That's a Spartan with horns. Come on. <laughs> history mashup oh here i love this since i teach at portland state and i also got my degrees at portland state and then <laughs> this was their <laughs> this was a, a, a donation campaign wow. slogan <laughs> <laughs> i mean okay granted it is the portland state vikings vikings are their their mascot so that's legit but still wow who came up with this like, <laughs> yeah that's what we're going with <laughs> what no no it checks out yeah right (laughs) (laughs) uh okay i guess maybe this could be a reference to the vikings burning some of the monasteries that they looted (laughs) that's i feel like this is in reverse it's the they went the anyway it's a (laughs) mix-up what else Viking fire protection (laughs) (laughs) here you go oh yeah 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 the viking uh missions yep yep viking one viking two could have named it anything, but they named it a Viking. Because that one does explorers. that makes sense to me. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, right. Explorers, right? Uh, here's your another your more construction companies for somehow you know, for some reason <laughs> the construction guys like the uh, Norse imagery. Yeah, I think part of that there's a whole uh, a whole can of worms that we're just not going to open this episode. Yeah, we're not gonna... <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we won't go there um but you know i mean clearly i mean anybody knows anything about marketing right i mean you choose things very with intent right like what is what does this invoke for somebody like what is the message you're trying to convey here about how you design and build a house Uh, that it's your own personal valhalla (laughs) that it's like your own your mead hall in the sky where i don't know what what are they trying to do here well i think these people are trying to communicate something about themselves you know like yeah you know, honor, integrity, you know, I think there's a, so this is, so kind of steering this in a different direction, you know, going back to the question of like, why the Vikings and not say the Spartans or the Samurai, which they're all, these warrior cultures all have some kind of, of popularity, but just not at the same level as the Vikings, right? Right. And I always go back to the 19th century, which you and I, Terry, have discussed as your least favorite century in, in all of history. Yep. But it's also the genesis of the study of the Vikings and when the Vikings even became a thing. When the word Viking entered the English language in a meaningful way, right? And so right. there's the and that's where that's where it really started and there's this idea of the romantic the romanticization of of the Vikings and and I, so I have and I it take me too long to find it to put it on the screen here. 
but I have a, a kind of an out of the box lecture that I have just on hand in case I get invited somewhere and I just need to pull something out of a hat. Uh, and the whole first 10 slides just talks about how Vikings even became a thing in the Anglophone world, at least. Uh, right. And when I say the Anglophone world, I'm also extending that a little bit to just Western European culture, because I, I do like to include, you know, France and Germany in those, right. um, to a certain extent, Spain. But, how, you know, they entered, they entered into the political sphere at a time when Europe was going through multiple upheavals. You had France that was going through multiple revolutionary situations. You had uh, England, which then became, you know, the the parliamentary uh, system. You had uh, uh, other countries in Europe that were starting to sort of follow France in that, you know, the so so you have all these nascent democracies and also old world monarchies, autocracies that were all vying for control over people and to give themselves political legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis their populations. And how they did that was they tried to take control of national narratives. So France, that's when you start seeing nationalism come up because that's right. essentially like, oh, France is this proud country that's been around since the Capetians. And, you know, and then, and, and at least uh, as far as France and England are concerned, when they talk about the the essentially the genesis of the modern concept of their nation so the french think of france starting with the capetians the the english start you know start with uh some of the anglo-saxon the later anglo-saxon kings and then really 1066 right, right. Uh, it all starts with the vikings and right. the vikings come in as this this heathen other this force of nature that came in and threatened to destroy these nations who then through and this is all this is where they took it this is just the 19th century of course and it was an age of belief right not not a ton of atheists back then so it was an age of belief and so the way they framed it was you know here's this divine provident you know divine providential situation where we overcame the heathen other with the help of god and so we are god appointed as a nation right and so that it's a kind of tying the legitimacy of the nation to uh for first to to a higher power but then also to this historical narrative that then gives people this idea that oh we come from this long proud tradition again trying to help people have a sense of their place in the world right. and define this national sentiment so it's the 19th century and so where the vikings come into this is really interesting because at first they come in as the heathen other but then over time they actually become the subject of fascination be because of how mysterious they were we re like most of the 19th century, we didn't have a Viking ship. Historians actually thought Viking ships might have been a myth. They had a couple of pictures on on rune stones or on, you know, the like the Gotland, the Storos hammers. They have yeah. their ships on there. Right. But that's about it. We did. We did. We had no one had pulled anything out of the ground yet. So there they entered the historical narrative almost as a myth. And from there they became, and then of course in the 19th century of the romantic period, and then so they became romanticized, right? And that's where it really starts. And so when I see this, like for example, Nordic Jam, this is hilarious. But you look at the guy, he's wearing a, a horn helmet, and that's that right. comes to us straight from the 19th century. Right. Holding the drinking horn in his hand. I mean, this the 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 popular notion today of the Vikings is almost identical to what it would have been in the late 19th century. Yeah, exactly. Right, which I find fascinating as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think, too, you know, to your point about, you know, sort of the creation of uh, origin myths, right, that all these nations, you know, and, and especially budding nations, like what was happening in the 19th century, but also particularly in Scandinavia, for sure. I mean, for instance, places like, like Norway is independent in 1905. Iceland is independent again, not till 1944. So they're like, you know, in the process of becoming and what better way to become or, or, or hope to be seen as a strong independent nation state than to look back to people in your past who like ooze strength and independence, right? I mean, that's the Vikings for sure. So they, yeah, they're latching onto all these qualities that they they, they want to build into sort of the story about who they are. Um, 
Yeah. So, it, okay. So wait, let's see, we only have a few more of these. Uh, so more alcohol, right? So there you go. Oh, more alcohol. So here's a, a metery in Portland where I live. Um, that, uh, Word. is real relatively <laughs> new and weird, weird, weird is actually an Anglo-Saxon and Norse word that means fate. So, I mean, this is okay. Good. They're at least, you know, the understanding of, you know, how much, um, fatalism, uh, was part of sort of the whole sort of psychology of the Viking age, uh, for Norse people. Um, oh, and this one, you know, okay. What? <laughs> Here's your plant protein shake. <laughs> What? I don't know. Happy triple, Viking. I mean, triple chocolate. Okay, here again. No, you won't know about chocolate in the Viking age. So, but a I'm, plant protein shake. Hmm, that was yeah. definitely the Vikings' first choice. Yeah. Not cod or herring. <laughs> I, want a, I, want a, I want a herring. That should be fish protein. That should be fish protein. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let's see what else. Oh, here more King of Norway. <laughs> Who sat around and thought Vikings? That's the best. They were travelers. Okay, I guess let's latch on to that. You don't know. In my day job, I am a marketer. And so if they, you know, it could be somebody a little bit like me. Yeah. You know, where it's just a, <laughs> oh, I've got a great idea. Well, because so I, I, I'm a, a marketing director for a seafood chain, seafood restaurant. And one of the one of the ideas that we had for a commercial or like a video was to just dress somebody up like a Viking and because it's a seafood boil. So you eat with your hands too, right. you're breaking open the crab. And I was like, we, I mean, we, we have to do Vikings on this one. Like <laughs> it's, too, it's too obvious, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, cause we, that's what we tell people like, get in there, like dig in, like be a barbarian, you know, so, like, yeah. so be a Viking, break open the crab, you know, like, and, or maybe have people like eating it and just have a Viking standing over them going, ha, 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 yes, crack the crab, break the crab. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, it would be funny, but you know, would it, would it bring more people to the restaurant? I don't know. Cause <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. What is that communicating? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's the other part of it too, I guess, if you want to go maybe towards a more negative interpretation of what we all think about Vikings and that is, you know, fighting back against the sort of white supremacist type of, you know, Nordic myth that again, I mean, talking about what you were mentioning before, as far as co-opting and creating national narratives, you know, so, you know, Hitler and the Nazi party famously did that and essentially kind yeah. of ruined it, you know, and then you get a bunch of people who are thinking that the, the, the Nor Norse are, you know, sort of this pure Aryan race and all of that, you know, myth that they you know put forth uh, in the say 20s and 30s with the rise of the Nazi party. And it's like, thank God for the hard sciences nowadays that are showing mm -hmm. us, you know, more and more that's like nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, those people were, you know, traveling all over the place, intermixing, interbreeding, intermarrying, intersettling, whatever, with a lot of different types of peoples. And, um, you know, and it also gets to the thing of like, you know, to be a Viking is essentially a job description. It's not an ethnicity anyways, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and so anybody can get on a boat and go and raid and do things. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of pushing back against that. Again, the idea of co-opting this particular history for the purposes of a particular, you know, person or group of people. And, you know, and my students will ask me about this with, with you know, that kind of use of the whole Viking thing, you know, um, and I just... It's like, well, how about, you know, if we just educate them about what, what the real Viking history is? And it's kind of like, well, yes, absolutely. And that's part of what we do. But the other thing is like, I think that that only will actually go so far because for people like that, the real history is not going to change their minds. They want Vikings to be what they think they are, uh, because without that part of the narrative, then those groups, you know, they, they, they think they don't exist, right? Because that's like underpins the entire thing. And so, and it's not really about understanding the real history. It's about building a history and a myth that they want. Right. It's uh, taking control of the historical narrative to legitimize the people who are in power. Uh, actually, I was watching a show yesterday about about World War II, uh, World War II in color, I think the 2018 version, which is pretty cool. And there's a section where they talked about uh, Goebbels, who was the basically the public speaker, the main orator for the Nazi party. And 
And he had a famous quote where he said, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, as long as you say it enough times, it becomes true. Right. You know, and it's, and that's how they took control of that national narrative was by pushing all these, these ideas over and over and over again until people just started to assume that, oh, well, they must be true. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I think with the Vikings, we've, we've seen that because they've been co-opted so many times for so many di- different national narratives that we've just heard over and over again, here's what they espoused. They were warriors and pirates and, uh, and, and, so then there are a lot of things that we see like in these Viking sightings with the horns and, you know, the certain, certain imagery that's communicated to us that, that is, is a result or a lasting legacy of this frequent regular co-opting yep. of, of the historical narrative of who, of who the Vikings actually were. Yep, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, we try to investigate them from a historical standpoint, at least in my job, my line of work, um, to figure out as much as we can with some level of certainty. But, you know, you can't get there 100%. And there's this phrase in science, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, the God in the gaps. Have you ever heard of that? The Yeah, the God of the gaps, yeah. 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 I mean, it's kind of like that, you know, it's like, it's like the history of the gaps. It's like, wherever the gaps are, we just pour ourselves right in there, you know? And it's like, yeah, this is, this is what I want that to have been. So that's what it's going to be for me. There's like also another one of the, you know, like Viking, like the real badass Viking thing, since badass was one of the words on our word cloud there, um, is the, the idea of the blood eagle, right? Do you know uh, this sort of ritual torture? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I got dinged for my opinion on that uh, when I was auditioned for a history channel show but anyway continue <laughs> yeah well yeah so i mean you know it, it's one of those kind of you know larger than life myth things about the vikings that they did this gruesome thing right and then there was an article published by a scholar it's been a number of years ago now like in the 80s i think that um you know basically kind of debunks it you know and her argument is i don't a i don't know that it actually ever existed or if it did it probably didn't exist in the kind of gruesome way that we've come to know it in the modern era and here's why i think this and it was basically this kind of literary investigation of how these poems and sources get sort of translated and misread and then translated and whatever over time and it basically boils down to like a telephone game right and it becomes one one thing at the end of it that it absolutely wasn't at the beginning and so then my students read that and like there's like disappointment you know I'm like damn I wanted them to be these kinds of people who would have done that to other people and it's like well a why but b I remember having one student early on where he's like you know what I don't care I just don't care if it's not a thing I want it to have been a thing so in my mind it's going to be a thing forever and it's like okay he yes. should. Uh, he should. He should read my blog because I did write an article about us. Uh, I wouldn't call it a study, but there was a paper written by a surgeon who looked at uh, looked. At, he he looked at the blood eagle as we understand it, yep. and his conclusion was, you know, with modern tools, this that's a very important precision. With modern tools and techniques, it it is feasible to have carried out a blood eagle in the manner that we think it might have occurred uh, with and and kept the person alive just like a couple of years ago of course that that paper was taken by the people who want to believe that the blood eagle was a real thing it's like see it's proof it's proof no 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 no. major caveats right it's like a a few years ago there was another one is another surgeon who looked at vlad the impaler and they had the testimony of of the ottoman um oh who was that uh Mud Mehmet the second or third anyway whoever was whoever was invading it's the the story is Vlad impaled three thousand of his own people in front of in front of his castle to freak out the Ottomans the the Sultan was so shocked he rode home to Istanbul and hid away in his palace for like three weeks just in horror at what he saw and they described the wriggling bodies on top of these pikes right Right. and so historians have always thought well that's probably an exaggeration because there's no way you could keep you know impale somebody from the back up to the front you know from from the back hole to the front hole Uh, I'm trying to be PC I just uh, anyway yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and there's no way to keep them alive well a surgeon looked at that and said (laughs) <laughs> actually <laughs> but again the caveat using modern understandings of anatomy and physiology and modern right. t- you know things we it, it is feasible to 
you know, basically impale somebody in that manner and keep right. them alive. But could they have done it back then in the 15th century or whenever it was? Yeah. Um, pro- yeah. Probably not. <laughs> I want to know, my first question with that kind of stuff is not actually, is it physically possible, but like, um, so how long of a time span did that happen over? Because they make it always sound like, yeah, and in, in one day, this dude single-handedly like executed 3,000 people this way. And it's like, okay, A, there's only so many minutes in a day. And if I break that down to like, I don't know what, 30 seconds per person, like, okay, how many people does that multiply out to? It's like, okay, that's just not possible. Well, Um, it's not 30 seconds if you're trying to have surgical precision, right? Right, exactly. (laughs) You have to be very quick about these things. Um, So actually, yeah, so we can post these articles in, uh, in our description for anybody who's interested in checking out this Blood Eagle stuff. Because yeah, so that student that I mentioned, so he was before the article that you were talking about, because I know the one you're talking about, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. because my students actually do get access to that one now as well, too, because that was only a couple of years ago. And just to say medically and physiologically it's possible does not ergo translate into the Vikings actually did this thing. So, and then also, right, for maybe those people out there who were saying blood eagle, blood eagle, and they don't know what we're talking about, then um, it's, it was a method of execution. You can check out the, the Vikings, the original Viking show from History Channel. I think it was like season two, maybe around episode seven or something. The episode is actually titled Blood Eagle. And so you can watch in all its gruesome horror, you know, the their version of it. But torturing somebody by, you know, basically splitting open their back. And I mean, really splitting it open, right? Like cutting the skin and then, mo- you know, removing or, or pulling apart, cutting and pulling apart the rib cage so that you can reach in, pull the lungs out and then kind of splay them out like like the, the wings of an eagle. And all of this supposedly happening while they are uh, uh, awakened, you know, cognizant of what's happening to them. Right. So, um, yeah, and evidently it's possible, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know. But again, it's the, it's, there's a, a mythological component to that, right? Where it's, right. it's, it's an, it's still an idea. There's no, there's nothing behind it really that, that can prove it. Right. And going back to just the Vikings in general, you know, so why are the Vikings so popular? There is that mythological component. Uh, yep. where in the public consciousness there is an image that we you know and it's it's always like it's it's always a, a tug of war between the internal and external worlds right yep. for for human beings and so we have a lot of internal things going on and then we project those out into the world so going back to your you know your word bubble i think people want to espouse a more warrior-esque way of being right like nobody wants to be weak yeah. Nobody wants to be um, vulnerable to harm, and really, the Vikings espouse this this way of being that is that is strong, that is hard, that is you know debonair, self reliant. I think self reliance is a big one because in Western culture, at least, self reliance is part and parcel to our entire culture. It's it's in our political discussions. It's you know, oh, you're poor, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? right. Like that's particularly sound, to me. Yeah, to me, that sounds like a very Viking thing, you know. Oh, look at little Ivar. He can't get up and his legs. Are, well, he should build crutches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pull yourself up by your own resources, you know. And and right. uh, so there is this kind of, uh, and, I, and I think that's it's particularly, and I'm only going to speak for American culture now because yeah. uh, I'm most familiar with it. And to my knowledge, the French don't really espouse this, but there is there the, this theme is also echoed in say for example the westward expansion yeah. this dream of cowboys and indians which by the way was invented by hollywood because right. cowboys and indians didn't really fight in the manner that you see in hollywood movies it was the united states federal government with their right. cavalry that went in and exterminated everybody right. uh so very different but still in the public conscience cowboys are still this very alluring yeah. concept that you know my ex-wife lives in burns and yeah. they all think they're cowboys yeah it's uh-huh. really interesting right yeah. it's the, but and it's that same if if you took that same word bubble and you went to burns you say what do you think of a cowboy and they're going to tell you they're warriors and they're honorable and they you know they're badasses and, independent you know. <laughs> and yeah do their own thing yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I know. I've actually been down to Spray, Oregon, which is over in that direction, like south of John Day, uh, and took my parents to a ranch where that's what we did was we played cowboy for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> rode horses and uh, wrangled up cattle and the whole thing. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it it's definitely true. It's a whole way of life that seems very, has the same kind of qualities to it. I think one of the other things about Vikings, um, and I have to say, you know, again, I'm guilty of this myself because I kind of, I, not kind of, I do, I do appreciate this as a quality and I hope it's not taken inappropriately or incorrectly by, by our audience, but they live unapologetically. And I, to me, that doesn't mean just being, you know, kind of a, you know, a, a, a mean person or a not nice person, just wantonly and randomly, and you don't care about other people. What I mean is, is the way that that invokes a sort of self-confidence, right? That they kind of do the things in the world that they do in a way that, you know, is important to them and they don't really um, apologize for it too much. <laughs> Uh, does that make sense? I don't know. I, yeah, I mean that makes sense to me. Yeah. 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 So, so I guess the thesis that we're landing on at the right. end of this, yep. at the end of this show of why the Vikings are so popular. You know, we we detoured a little bit because a lot of uh, one of the things that I like to say is I equate you know Vikings with uh, dinosaurs a little bit. There's the paleontologist Jack Horner who always asks you know why are dinosaurs so so popular, right? Yeah. And yeah. and his answer is always because they're big and they're scary and they lived a long time ago. Right. And it kind of applies to the Vikings. But <laughs> here we 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 landed on this idea that really the the uh Vikings are popular because they have become a a modern phenomenon yeah. that is a reflection of the public conscience of or consciousness of who we want to be, who we espouse to be like almost. Yep. Yep. Right. Exactly. There are cer certain qualities that we we are reaching for, in a sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because um, I've mentioned you and I've talked about this before, where I have I've I've given public talks about this. As a matter of fact, one of them you can see out there on the Internet and it's on YouTube on the uh, channel for Nordic Northwest. It's just this idea of these conceptions and misconceptions my students have. And I only discuss four of them, but they have to do with these things that we hold seem to hold very dear, right? And, and again, the shield maiden thing. So that, you know, speaks to sort of feminist qualities of strong women who can do anything a man can do and all of that. Uh, the idea that the Vikings were, you know, basically the best warriors, you know. So again, that kind of idea of strength or winning and being the best at everything. Also, the egalitarian nature of Viking Age society, you know, that somehow supposedly men and women were equal and this and that. And I mean, it's just all of these things are just like, it's just us, you know, and mm -hmm. we're just like throwing it back onto those people who who we actually in, in very concrete ways know some certainties about each of those things. You know, we know they had social stratification. We know men and women were not equal, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And yet people are like, nope, <laughs> that's still what we see because we want to see it. And I'm always like, this is boring. Why, why do you even want to look at people in the past and understand them? I'm like, understand them on their own terms. Why do I want to look back there if all I ever see is me reflected in, in the mirror back to myself? It's like, I, I don't want that. Right. So, but somehow that is just what people do. I don't know. It's the process of being understood, perhaps. Yeah. Or trying to understand oneself. That's what we're all after these days, right? Right. Right. Okay. So, but just to wax a little bit philosophical on that, I mean, it's the same is true. The Vikings lived in their own context, and so do we. So I know, like, like concentrate on who we are and being the best people we can be I don't know rather than because we also another part of it too is like we like to judge people in the past for having done things that we don't think are right or whatever and um I don't know yeah maybe it is maybe it is it's all just sort of psychological sort of self-reflection that we're doing I don't know you know that's actually going back to that waxing philosophical and uh, we we may want to to make this the last the last uh, gambit, if you will, yeah, <laughs> yeah, for trying to answer this question, we probably aren't gonna. I mean, for those of you who are watching, hoping that we're gonna have a definitive answer for you, uh, you will be sorely disappointed because we're just throwing out ideas. This is a very complex question that 
actually a lot of very talented academics are trying to answer as well through right. various you know means but for me as a writer i um i understand the story through narratives there was that book that came out recently sapiens by yuval noah talking about how what makes homo sapiens different from yeah say Neanderthals is uh, this idea that we can create stories that we right. can all agree to believe in. Right. And that has allowed us to, to gather and organize in ways that other homo could, could not. Right. So like right. a Neanderthal group could organize in groups of maybe 40 and we could do 40,000. And so guess who won? We did. Yeah. As, uh, and it's all because we could have we could have a shared belief, but objectively, that story doesn't exist in the world. We made it up, and it was just so that we could all get along together. And so humans are are wired to interpret the world through stories, storytelling. Yeah. That's why mythologies are so important. And contained in mythologies are important lessons for how to how to right. live one's life. The process of change, right? Uh, like the hero's journey is a process of change, and it's one right. that we all cycle through subconsciously and that's why we we latch on to these stories yeah so as far as the vikings and why they're so popular it re really is because they fit quite well within the narrative i think that people are telling themselves about how to live in the world today yep right exactly. and and so that's it's it's basically they are only popular because they fit well within the story that we're telling ourselves yep. about who we are and what we're doing today uh, especially latching onto these ideas of who they were, or at least the qualities, right? We kind of ignore that. Right. <laughs> yeah. We ignore the other stuff. But like, you know, my books, yeah. for example, I, I go through, I had, I had a funny review on one of my books because it's, you know, they're the saga of Hastings, the Avengers. So that's Hastings, right? And he's the, that's the French pronunciation, Hastings, you know, the French pronunciation of Hastings. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, he, you know, going back to, I made him a little bit incompetent and so forth. And, and he, he, really like throughout the the series and i tried to make this abundantly clear through his actions and his failures he's trying to espouse all of these things and now he's he is a viking and so looking back at him from the modern lens we only see what we see he sacked this city and he did this and so he is this he, you know that's what he did and we want to espouse that and in the book what i do is i make him human where he's he's trying to do the he's trying to espouse to those things too and right. terrible at it like there's a huge learning curve with all the things. And I had a review one time that came in. I don't remember where it was or what platform it was on, but I read it and I got, I got a kind of a, 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 it tickled my funny bone because the person basically said, you know how they tell you that they always tell you never meet your heroes. Yeah, <laughs> because, right. <laughs> because they, they read the book and they realized what I had done with it and showing that like, oh, he's not, you know, just a warrior who's badass and all these things he's 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 also kind of a rotten guy at the beginning <laughs> and he makes some mistakes and he's a little like you know and it, so there's so in making him human it kind of shattered that myth for that that person and and um they i i, I mean it was a good review they enjoyed the book but at the end of the day they it it, it i think it changed how they how they view I, I don't know. I mean, it's a, from the review, I, I gleaned that they, they'd learned a little bit of something about how they view the Vikings, right? Bringing that that measure of humanity uh, to the story. Because stories can remove humanity very easily if you tell it the right way, right? Or yeah. it can infuse it with humanity. So you can go both ways. Yeah. And I think on some level, yeah, I think that maybe that this person wants something that they can look up to. Um, but on the other level, I mean, it, there has to be that humanity in there or else it's not relatable. You, you can't see anything in it. And I think maybe that's what we can say here at the end. Like, why are we fascinated with the Vikings or who were the Vikings or whatever? It's like, well, they were people, <laughs> they were humans and they provide lessons for humanity. I think one of the more interesting parts about uh, the Norse view, and this is prior to Christianity, so the real Viking kind of stuff is this idea of fatalism, right? We've talked about this before, right? The Norns mm -hmm. weave the fate of every human being. The fate is already known, but what matters? Who you are as a human. And mm -hmm. as as the great historian and archaeologist Neil Price has said, you know, what matters is how you conduct your life as you go to meet your fate, and so I think that's what everybody's struggling with, right? How to be a human and why we're here. And so Vikings, I think, help us understand that a little bit. 
Well, that's one theory at least. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we do as historians. We just throw them out there and hope something sticks. <laughs> well, so for those of you who are watching, and because I feel like this is a question we're going to bring up over and over and over again on the show, probably. Well, maybe not over and over again, but a couple of times. So uh, put into the comments, what, what do you think uh, makes the Vikings so popular in the general public in popular culture. What yeah. do you think has made Vikings such an enduring and lasting presence in marketing? And oh, and I do want to bring that full circle. All of your pictures, that was all marketing. So I, yeah. I stand by my statement. The Vikings were just outstanding marketers, the best of all time. <laughs> Yep, I, I frequently say Vikings sell. <laughs> it's just it's just the reality of it. Vikings sell. If you want to if you want to get eyeballs, <laughs> if you want to get clicks, <laughs> put the word Viking in it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Not to be confused with the football team, though. Oh my gosh, that's right. always right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that does it for today. That was whew, we went a little yeah. longer than we anticipated, but uh, yeah. I think that was pretty valuable. Yeah, it's fun. All, All right. right. So next up, uh, next next episode, we have uh, Lesek. Yep. Yep. Lesek Gardella, who is um, an archaeologist, and he is a researcher at the National Museum of Denmark in Copenhagen. And he will be talking to us about Eastern Vikings. So Vikings in the Slavic lands, which a lot of people tend not to know that much about. So it'll be cool. Well, uh, thanks for joining me, Terry. And yep. we will see each other next, next week. week. Yep. All right. See you then. Sounds. Cheers.